Welcome to my second video about the full rule set of High Frontier for All, the Stellar Masterpiece by Phil Eklund, published by Sierra Madre Games, and Iron Game Design. With the previous video, we learned how to fly a rocket, and thus, you are able to navigate the solar system from Mercury to Neptune. But now, it's time to make sense of it all. Because why would you navigate the solar system? What is your purpose? First, as a nation or a private company, you want to claim your rights on remote sites, planets, moons, and asteroids. Each player has nine faction discs in his color. If he manages to put these discs on sites, he claims their ownership and gains one victory point per disc. There is an operation to do this, prospection. Prospecting a site means going to it and looking for resources like water and ore. Only units with ISRU are able to do this. ISRU stands for In-Situ Resource Utilization. This is the ping box you find on the top left of Robonaut and Crew Cards. Let's suppose Yellow Player sent his rocket far away onto Comet Holmes, carrying his crew and surviving a hazard. Now, he chooses to do a prospection operation, as is one operation available per turn. And first, just to be able to try a prospection, Yellow Player must pass the prerequisite. He must have an ISRU rating equal or lower than the site's hydration. Hydration is shown as the number of water drops. Comet Holmes' hydration is 4, so Yellow Crew has just enough ISRU to pass the prerequisite. Then, to actually try the prospection operation, he must roll a die and get a result equal to or lower than the site size. Comet Holmes is a very small site. Its size is 1. So, only a roll of 1 will succeed. Yellow player rolls a 4 and misses. In such a case, a red disc is put on the site. It means that prospection didn't find anything valuable and no player can try a prospection roll here anymore until the end of the game. Because Yellow Crew's ISRU is high, Yellow player cannot try prospection on any sites around with an hydration of 3 or lower. He can try on Chiron. This site has an hydration of 4, so prerequisite is OK. And with a size of 4 also, Yellow player needs to roll a 4. He rolls a 2. That's a success. Yellow player puts a yellow disc to show that, from now on, this site is his. 4 is the worst value for an ISRU. This is a default value for all crews. But player can also bring Robonauts on board. This Robonaut, with an ISRU of 3, opens prospections to more sites. Those with an hydration of 3. Like crews, some Robonauts, but not all of them, have their own thrust triangles so they can assemble a rocket and fly by themselves without any thruster. And note that a better ISRU doesn't give you more chance to pass your prospection roll. It just opens more sites to prospection by making the prerequisite easier. Now you've certainly noticed that there are three different kinds of ISRU. The common one shows the symbol of a rocket and works exactly as we just saw. Some other ISRU shows the symbol of a lunar buggy. This kind of robonaut or crew can easily travel on the site's surface so it can explore a larger zone. In game terms, it can roll a second time if it fails its first prospection roll, wherever it is. And if it is on a planet with several sites linked with a yellow path, it can prospect all linked sites with the same prospection operation. Such paths are only found on planets and moons with a size larger than 6, so they are prospected without the need of any die roll. Let's suppose Yellow Rocket landed on Mars. With an ISRU of 4, it cannot prospect the site it is on. But because this robonaut is of the buggy type, it can follow the yellow path and, with only one prospection operation, prospect the two other linked sites that have an hydration of 4, without any die roll because Mars size is 10. 
The third kind of ISRU shows the symbol of a laser pistol. These robonauts can prospect adjacent sites. That means they don't need to land on a site to prospect it. A rocket is adjacent to a site if there is only a line between them without any dot or crossing. Crash hazard, skull dots and lander burns, pink dots with small legs, don't hinder adjacency because remember they represent more travel events than actual space zones or orbits. Here with a laser gun robonaut, yellow rocket can prospect with a single operation up to four sites. With an ISRU of 1, it meets the prerequisites for all of them. Yellow player must roll the die for the two smallest ones. He misses the first and passes the other. So it successfully prospects three sites and the missed one is marked with a red disc. Such a laser gun robonaut with a very low ISRU can be very convenient to prospect a lot of sites without landing on each. And that's it, you know how to prospect and claim sites with Robonauts or crew because crew also have ISRU ratings. Note that you cannot prospect and put your disc on a site that already has another player's disc. We will see later that there are ways to steal properties, but for the moment, let's keep it peaceful. So, up to now, you had a rocket with just a thruster inside, an engine to push it to the stars. And now, you want to add a robonaut to do some prospection once among the stars. But look, every time a card shows such a white rectangle with symbols in it, that means that this card needs other cards in order to work properly. This robonaut needs a generator because it needs electricity and generators produce electricity. When a card needs another card, we call that a support chain. Very simple, you just need a card that matches the symbol. And look, it's not over. The generator we just added also needs support. It needs a reactor. And the slash bar means that player can choose one type of reactor or the other, nuclear or combustion engine. Here, a fission reactor will do the trick. And now, it's okay, we have a perfectly valid support chain. If player wants to use this robonaut on a space mission, he will have to bring with it a generator for electricity and a reactor to power the generator. On his player mat, he would stack all this card on his rocket box and that would constitute his rocket with a total dry mass of 2. Had we used this other thruster instead, he would be supported by the same reactor as the generator a card can support multiple other cards. Note that this rocket can perfectly lift off and fly. The robonaut lacks its support generator, so it doesn't work, but that doesn't prevent the rocket to fly, its thruster being fully operating. This other rocket cannot fly because to move a rocket you need to activate a thrust triangle, and neither triangle has its operating support chain. Both cards are inactive. Ok, we saw that several cards can share the same support card, but that's not true for radiators. Let's look at this rocket. Its generator uses a combustion engine, the little bomb symbol, but besides the bomb symbol, there's also a thermometer symbol. That means that if this energy source is chosen, this generator will produce heat and require one unit of cooling, one thermometer. And the reactor also will produce twice as much heat, requiring twice as much cooling, so two more thermometers. Thermometers are additive. This rocket requires a total of three thermometers. Each radiator has two sides. Here, for example, this dielectric X-ray window must be rotated this way to give enough cooling power, three thermometers. And then it's OK. And see that this single robonaut needs a total of three support cards to work properly. As you see also, the three thermometer version of our radiator is heavier than its two thermometer side. The player chooses which side he will use the moment he boosts this card into low Earth orbit. 
You remember, this is the boost operation, and this is the moment when the card from an ID in player's hand becomes a physical item in low Earth orbit. Once a physical item, it's too late for the player to change his mind and rotate the radiator. In fact, not exactly. Any radiator has a heavy and a light side. Now, imagine that heavy side is an upgraded version of light side. That means that if a radiator on its heavy side is destroyed, for example if it fails a belt roll, it is just rotated to its light side instead of being decommissioned. Just as if it had two hit points on heavy side and lost one to light side. In particular, as a free action, a player can on purpose decide to turn his radiator from its heavy side to its light side. The other way is not possible. To make a light radiator heavy, you must first decommission it to your hand, then boost it with the boost operation to the LEO. Finally, the use of an afterburn also can produce cooling. This is because afterburn is obtained by dumping water in the engine. And thus, a thrust triangle using afterburn gets one free thermometer. As an example, let's consider this thruster with its support chain. On standard mode, it cannot work because it lacks one thermometer for cooling. But as long as it does an afterburn every turn, it can use this afterburn induced thermometer and work perfectly well. Now, perhaps did you notice that some support cards have what looks like a thrust triangle but on a black background? These are modifiers that change the thrust triangle of the supported card. Here, for example, this Dumbo thruster gets a bonus of plus 3 best thrust going from 6 to 9 and no modifier on fuel consumption. The ratio 1 on 1 means no modifier. The owner of this large rocket can choose between two thrust triangles to activate. It is not uncommon to have several thrust triangles among rocket's cards. But at the beginning of a movement, the player must choose only one. Here, if he chooses to activate the Robonaut, he will add its reactor's modifiers for a total thrust of 8 and a fuel consumption of 2 per burn. But if he chooses to activate his thruster's triangle, he doesn't get the reactor's modifier because it doesn't belong to the thruster support chain. Ok, you need thrusters to move, robonauts to prospect, and generators, reactors, and radiators as support chains. That's easy, and still, there's a type of card you don't know yet, refineries. You need refineries to build factories. After prospecting a site, the next industrial step is to build a factory on it. This is the industrialize operation. Very easy, you just need a site you previously claimed with a prospect action, so a site with a disk in your color. Then, you decommission a refinery and a robonaut. The refinery is the plant able to dig and melt metals or what ore you can find on your foreign site. And the robonauts are the mechanized workers able to work this plant. Let's suppose Yellow Player moves his rocket from planet Earth to Eisfeldia. There, as an operation with his robonaut, he rolls a die and succeeds in prospecting the site. He puts a yellow disc to claim it. And that's all for this turn because he can do only one operation per turn. But next turn, he does the industrialized operation. So he decommissions the robonaut and the refinery and all support cards required to make them operational. Decommission means moving these cards back to player's hand. These items are combined into a factory that is a yellow cube on the site and their cards become IDs again, patterns in player's hand. Note that the radiator isn't decommissioned because you never need cooling device for a factory on a site. Yellow players just build a factory and this factory now wears the same type as the site it is on. In our example, yellow's factory type is C. So it mines and transforms the carbon it finds. Note that factory's type is given by the letter on the site 
and has nothing to do with the letter on the cards used to build that factory. Refineries and Robonauts letters don't even have to match. At the end of the game, Yellow Player will earn 11 victory points for this site, one for each game piece, disc, factory and rocket, and 8 points for Carbon's market value. Ok, so in order to move a rocket, then to prospect sites and build factories on it, you need cards. Cards of 6 kinds, the main thrusters, Robonauts and refineries, and the supporting generators, reactors, and radiators. These are IDs as long as they are in your hand and become actual items when you boost them to low Earth orbit. Fine, but where do you find these cards? How to get them? All cards start the game as 6 decks, one per card type and players can purchase cards with the research operation. It is an operation, so if you choose to do that, you cannot do any other operation during this turn. And first, there's a prerequisite. You cannot do a research operation if you already have 4 cards in hand or more. You can always discard any number of cards from your hand as a free action, and especially at the beginning of your turn to lower the number of cards in your hand down to 3 or below in order to become eligible for the research action. Then, the player chooses one card, one that is visible on top of a deck. He can look at this card both sides. The back of every card is black and we will see later how and when players can use it. Player can also see what the following card is, but he cannot flip it. All players can also see that this is not hidden. Let's suppose Yellow Player is doing the research operation. He is called the auctioneer because research operation is always an auction between players. So Yellow Player announces his first price for the item he chooses. This is a value in aquas, the glass beads he keeps on his player's mat. They represent fuel units that can be transferred in a rocket in low Earth orbit, but they are also the game currency. Beware, players can have fuel units elsewhere, inside a rocket or on an outpost far away on a foreign site, but players cannot use them as currency for research auction. Only bids in the LEO stack on player's mat can be used. Here, with 5 bids on his mat, Yellow player can bid up to 5 aquas. Yellow player can propose a bid of 0 aqua, hoping to get this card for free. Then, research operation is a free auction, so any player in any order can bid for the card yellow player did choose. If there is a tie, the auctioneer, so yellow player, decides who wins. So here, for example, yellow player just have to bid 3, like a green player, and if nobody overbids, he wins. He pays 3 aquas from his mat and gets the thruster into his hand, he just bought the patent. If the auctioneer doesn't win the bid, like here, for example, where grey player overbids everyone else, then grey player gets the card but pays it to the auctioneer, yellow player. So, when you choose to do the research operation, you are sure to win something. Either you win the right to buy the card you want, or someone else wins the auction and take the card, but you gain the money, the aquas. Finally, when you get a card, thanks to a research operation, you always gain it with one card for each support needed as indicated by the white rectangle. Here, for example, if yellow player wins the auction and gets the thruster, he also takes, for free, a reactor. He takes the topmost reactor card, even if it doesn't fit the symbol he needs. The rule is just that any card you buy comes with one card for each type of support it needs. But note also that this is just for the card you actually bought. You don't get support cards for the free support cards. So, here, yellow player buys the thruster and gets a free reactor, that's all. If someone buys the generator, he gets one free reactor and one free radiator. And now you know where all the cards you need come from. They come from six decks that constitute a patent market.
Okay, but how do you earn the money you need to pay these patents? First, there is a very simple operation, the income operation. You choose this operation and you earn one aqua, one blue glass beads that you put in your LEO stack. And remember, because you can do only one operation per turn, if you choose to get this one aqua for your treasury, you can do nothing else this turn. This is a very slow way to earn money. Another way is to sell your patents. This is the free market operation. You discard a card from your hand and gain three aquas. You cannot sell more than one card per turn. The discarded card goes back to the market at the bottom of its deck. And now you see the entire cycle. You get money, you buy cards, you boost them to LEO into a rocket that you send to the stars for prospecting new sites, claiming them and building factories. Okay, and so what? You build factories in deep space on alien sites, but what for? To earn victory points? Yes, but factories can do a lot more. First, the cube you put on a site is not just a factory, it's a space base. And as such, it eases rocket landing and liftoff. Remember when we learned how to land a rocket? There was two ways to land. Using the powers of rocket thrusters for a powered landing or falling to the ground using the atmosphere and some useful parachute to slow down your fall, the so-called aerobrake landing. And now, guess what? There's a third way to land, and this is the factory-assisted landing, where your rocket uses factory's facilities to help in its maneuvering. This type of landing doesn't use a rocket's engine, so there's no prerequisite on rocket's net thrust. The only prerequisite being that a factory must be there on the site where your rocket tries to land. This type of landing implies some risk. Player must roll a die and his rocket is destroyed on landing on a roll of one. He can avoid that by committing a team of engineers. This is the FINAO solution as failure is not an option. It costs four aquas for the LEO stack and automatically succeeds without any die roll. Factory assisted landing is not possible on strong gravity environment, that is, where there is a lander burn symbol. Oh, and so it does not seem so convenient. Let's see some elements of site's geography to understand what your actual options are. To begin with, there are small sites, the ones whose size is between 1 and 5. A powered landing on these sites is possible just because powered landing is always possible as long as your rocket has one more thrust than the planet's size. And because gravity is low enough, these sites never have a lander burn. And so a factory assisted landing is also always possible if there's a factory on the site. Building a factory on such a site is a good solution to allow rockets with low thrust. There is never an atmosphere on this small planet, so no possible aerobrakes landing. Then there are large sites, those with size equal to 6 or greater. Of course, you can make powered landing on these sites, but it will require large values of net thrust, something hard and costly to achieve. Path to such large sites always ends with some lander burns, and so you will never do factory-assisted landing on them, even if you build a factory there. Finally, aerobrake landing availability depends on whether there is an atmosphere or not. On Mars, you can. On the Moon, you cannot. So don't expect the factories to solve all your landing problems, but still, they can be useful. And what about liftoff? As you remember, liftoff is very close to landing, and as there is a factory-assisted landing, there is a factory-assisted liftoff. Exactly the same. It works like a powered liftoff without any prerequisite on net thrust value, but with a hazard die roll. There's no such thing as aerobrake liftoff. You cannot lift off a rocket with a parachute. But there's a special way to lift off, and this is the acetylene liftoff. This is a kind of factory-assisted liftoff, so you need a factory on the site. 
The idea is to produce acetylene from the planet's atmosphere and use it to power your rocket. So your site needs an atmosphere, that is a cloud symbol. For example, there is an atmosphere on all three sides of Mars. And then your rocket can do a factory assisted liftoff through a lander burn spot. This uses the same process as a standard factory assisted liftoff with a hazard die roll. And the player must use a quantity of fuel equal to twice his rocket's total weight mass. These units of fuel don't count in the total weight mass. They are used by the factory, but of course, this fuel must be taken from the site and not from the LEO reserve. After liftoff, the rocket must still burn fuel as usual when moving through the lander burn. Here, Yellow Player has a rocket and a factory on the North Pole of Mars. But it cannot do a factory-powered liftoff because it would pass through a lander burn. Luckily, Mars has an atmosphere, so an acetylene liftoff is possible. It costs twice the rocket's wet mass, that is 12 fuel units. This fuel is not burned from the rocket, but spent by the factory. We will see very soon how a factory can produce its own fuel. Without this huge amount of fuel, another solution here would be possible. The idea being to take fuel units from the rocket itself. Yellow rocket can get rid of four units of fuel. This is a cargo transfer free action. Cargo transfer is a transfer from stack to stack. Fuel units are taken from the rocket stack. Okay, but where to? To an outpost. Remember, every player has two outpost stacks on his mat. These are two utility stacks. We can remove four units of fuel from the rocket on Mars to put them in the first outpost, for example. Then we put the outpost token on the map to show where they are now, always on Mars, but out of the rocket. And now the factory can use these four fuel units to pay twice the rocket weight mass, that is now two. Two times two equals four. The factory spent four blue beads and yellow rocket can perform an acetylene liftoff out of Mars. You have noticed that when we pulled the fuel out of the rocket, we followed red dotted lines on the fuel strip and not black lines because this fuel was not burned for flying. It was just removed from the rocket. And that's it. Three ways to land, three ways to lift off, depending on the size of the site and whether it has an atmosphere. Back to our main topic, what is a factory for? Factory assisted landing and liftoff, okay, but what else? A factory can help you to produce fuel. This is the refuel operation. And first of all, you have to know that every card with an ISRU rating can do this refuel operation without the need of any factory. Here, for example, Yellow Rocket is on Mars and it carries a Robonaut with an ISRU of 2. As an operation, it can decide to refuel according to the following formula, the number of fuel units thus produced being equal to 1 plus the difference between site hydration and ISRU rating. So, for a good fuel production, you have to look for high hydration sites and low ISRU cards. Here, Yellow Rocket produces three units of fuel that can directly go inside the rocket as new wet mass. Okay, that's convenient, but it can be very slow, especially if the rocket is on a site whose hydration is equal to its ISRU rating. In such a case, it produces only one unit of fuel per turn and it will take a long time to fill its tanks. And that's where factories become very helpful. Because if a factory is on the site, it can produce seven units of fuel. Always seven, regardless of site hydration and without the need of any card with ISRU. These fuel units can directly be used to fill a rocket's tanks. But even without any rocket, the factory can produce its seven fuel units and keep them in an outpost like we already saw these fuel units waiting for a rocket to pass by and pick them up. Note 
that these blue beads cannot be used as aquas to pay for research, for example. Blue beads can be used as currency only if they are located in LEO stack, that is low Earth orbit. In order to use them as currency, yellow player must send a rocket to bring them back to Earth. There is a last operation for factories, and this is the main one. Factories can produce extraterrestrial stuff. This one is very easy. All cards that players have in their hand have two sides, a white side and a black side. As you remember, if you want to transform a card from your hand, an ID, into a real item, you use the boost operation and put the card in the LEO stack. You can never produce an item on its black side with the boost operation. The black side of a card represents an improved form of this technology, a form that cannot be built on Earth. Look here as the black side of this thruster is far more efficient with a fuel consumption of one tenth that is 40 times lower than its white side version. And so, to produce a black side item, you need a factory on an alien site. Okay, but with one condition, the letter on the factory site must match the letter on the card. For example, this black side thruster with the letter D can be produced with this factory on a letter D site. ET production operation is free, it costs nothing, the item is produced on the foreign site, so an outpost is needed just to stock the item. From there, you can send a rocket to pick up the new item, or you can even build a brand new rocket at your factory, as long as its components have all the same letter. And if you have to bring these items back to Earth, for example here because you need this white side radiator to make your rocket operational, you can do that without sending a rocket to pick them up. There is a special operation made to transport black cards back to Earth. This is the delivery operation. This operation takes one black card anywhere on the map and moves it to your LEO stack. This is an abstracted movement, we suppose you have some cargo transport units able to move your stuff. Only one card per turn, and there is a cost. You must pay a number of blue beads, fuel units, equal to twice the distance in heliocentric zone. Here, Yellow Factory with its outposts are located far away in Jupiter's heliocentric zone, three zones away from Earth, so the cost is six aquas. Beware, this cost must be paid from the starting outpost. Yellow player cannot use aquas from LEO for delivery operation. Here, Yellow Factory, for example, would first have to produce 7 fuel units with the refuel operation, then use them to pay for delivery, and do it again black card after black card. If the starting site size is 7 or greater, the cost is increased by 1 because of high gravity. And note that with this formula, delivery is free if from a site in the same heliocentric zone than planet Earth. Once in the LEO stack, black card can be used to build a rocket, for example, but it can also be sold as a free market operation. Instead of selling a white card from your hand for three aquas as we already saw, you can sell a black card from LEO. A black card is never in your hand. The money you will get is equal to its value on the market. Here, for example, our black card in LEO stack shows the letter D. Market value for D is 8, so yellow player earns 8 aquas for selling it. The sold black card is not lost, it gets back to yellow player's hand, but it is flipped back to its white side. Cards in hand are always white. The only way to flip them to black side is through the ET production operation. Ok, now you know why you did all that, why you built a rocket, why you claimed alien sites, why you built factories, you know all available operations. And finally, there's one last topic to address, human colonies, the climax of your space exploration. This is the last way to win victory points. 
To settle a human colony on an alien site, first you must have claimed this site, then built a factory and brought your crew. Here, Yellow Player did put his crew in his rocket. Crew cars are the only cars with human inside. So, to settle a colony, you must bring a crew. Then, it's very easy, it's a free action. You just add a colony wooden dome on top of your factory, then you decommission your crew card. And because crew card is not an ID, not a patent, this is a team of human people, so you don't put your decommissioned crew into your hand, you put it instead in your LEO stack. In fact, the crew that was inside the rocket is now living a scientific life on the new colony. The card in the LEO is a new crew, a new team, ready to take his role in your space exploration. In our example, adding a human colony gives two victory points thanks to the astrobiology symbol, the little green leaf. Two points. Is it worth the effort? As we will see later, human people do have other benefits, but for the moment, let's take a break. You know all the basics of this game and you are quite ready to play the core game by yourself. In the next video, we will see what's left, a series of small rules, small space oddities, but that make this game so fun, so rich and unforgettable.